I grew up as a baby in aircraft leasing, basically, you know, <laughs> carrying various people's uh, briefcases, learning how to draft documents. Uh, I had to go out to all the countries with a questionnaire and find out what the legal system was like. There are currently five CEOs of uh, aircraft lessors who worked uh, for me or with me in Oryx. Uh, so that, I think that's a pretty good track record. I was always looking at the other top 20 aircraft leasing companies in terms of how they're all different. I'm going to uh, say, you've gone very serious all of a sudden. We're getting into engine total care agreement. I think soccer is a great metaphor for how aircraft leasing companies should work. Hello and welcome to the brand new episode of my podcast, Flight Path with Alok. David, uh, welcome to the show uh, of this podcast, Flight Path with Alok, with me. Uh, this is the fourth episode I'm recording and uh, I'm very grateful and thankful for your time, uh, which you have uh, especially made to join me today. I, you are in Portugal right now, morning 9 a.m. for you, and I'm recording you all the way from India. Uh, so, uh, you know, let's let's get right into it, you know, uh, just to know if you can... Just tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, I, I know you have been in the legal field uh, in the very beginning of your career, right? And so I would just like to understand how you got into aircraft leasing. What has been your background? Where are you from really first? Yeah. A little bit about that. Great. Thanks, Salak. And good to see you. You're a little bit uh, blurry, but uh, good morning. Uh, and, you know, it's great. Technology is fantastic. Now we can have a proper fireside chat conversation. Uh, you're in Bangalore and I'm in Portugal. So, you know, the yeah. joy of technology. But uh, yes, I did. I started my career as a solicitor and I trained in Dublin, Ireland. And I worked for a large firm called McCann Fitzgerald. And it was the one of the top two or three firms in Dublin at the time. And I went to school in Dublin, but I grew up in West Clare, actually west of Shannon, which would have been just west of GPA, where GPA, uh, Guinness Peace Aviation, one of the first aircraft less wars, uh, started in the late 1980s, 1985, 1986. And I grew up in a very rural part of the west of Ireland, uh, where there were not too many roads, a lot of singing and dancing, and uh, a lot of Gaelic sports and, you know, uh, very, very nice place, but very rural and very poor, actually, at the time. And I was close to the Shannon Free Industrial Zone, and that was the start of aircraft leasing. And actually many other businesses that now form, uh, not, not those businesses, but subsequent businesses that form the core of the success of Irish society and Irish financial services. Uh, so there's a long and rich tradition both uh, of musical and heritage and young people and people yeah. going to the American U US and then the Shannon Free Zone and then ultimately the Dublin IFSC growing out of that environment and uh, Guinness Beat Aviation and the start of aircraft leasing. But back to myself anyway, that's a long, long way around. Um, I grew up in the west of Ireland and then my parents moved to Dublin, uh, like almost, you know, everybody else. Uh, and uh, I went to university in Dublin. I didn't study law, though. I studied uh, accounting, finance, uh, maths. I have a, a Bachelor of Commerce degree. And during that degree, I had to do a law module. And I discovered that I liked it. So I sat nighttime exams to do the uh, solicitor's exams. And I passed them and I got my apprenticeship or traineeship with McCann Fitzgerald. And then they, by coincidence, worked for Aer Lingus and Tony Ryan had left Aer Lingus to set up GPA and they were acting for GPA. And given that I was uh, uh, not a lawyer as such, so I was an outsider to the lawyers because I, I had a BCom. I didn't do a law degree, but I'd passed the law exam. Mm -hmm. And um, this was good for uh, McCann Fitzgerald, as they saw it at the time, and placed me immediately into the aircraft leasing uh, section. So I, I grew up as a baby in aircraft leasing, basically, <laughs> you know, carrying various people's uh, 
briefcases, learning how to draft documents and uh, learning about corporate debt facilities. And actually, I remember one of my first tasks was a task probably nobody wanted to do, but I thought it was great. It was great to be innocent and young. Like, it's great to be young because you don't, you don't really sometimes understand things. So I was doing the worst job in the world, which to me was the best job in the world, which was going out to all the countries in the world because they had a corporate debt facility, uh, GPA. Actually, at the time, it was even massive. I mean, it was almost a billion dollars. It was NatWest and Chemical Bank and others. And this was in the late 80s. And it was, I think it was extended from 800 million to 1.2 billion. So to put it in perspective, it was a big business even then. And my job was under Catherine Dean at the time. I think you know Catherine Dean. Uh, and she's still, yeah. she was chairwoman of... Um, or I should say chairperson of McCann Fitzgerald. Uh, I don't know if she, maybe recently, I don't know if she still is, but um, she uh, was directing me. I had to go out to all the countries with a questionnaire and find out what the legal system was like. So India, China, you know, uh, Saskatchewan, uh, South America, you know, Brazil, uh, places that were barely, you know, that I'd barely heard of that were on my uh, world map, right. my atlas. You know, we had atlases then and uh, we had globes and things, you know. And uh, so that was my job, go out to all of these countries, uh, do a questionnaire, find out what the legal system is like and get the legal opinion for placing aircraft in those jurisdictions. So a very... A very great introduction to the world of aircraft leasing. I was also doing stuff like I specialized in tax for a while, uh, so it wasn't all aircraft leasing. But uh, one, I remember one of the jobs I had was to find out where you know I could set up companies with no capital tax. So I found out there were great country, a great places called Manitoba, Saskatchewan. You know. And then you got Isle of Man, and you got Guernsey, and then off Guernsey you had Sart and other places like that. Right, right, because right. at the time, uh, people were able to double or triple dip aircraft. So you could buy an aircraft one place, you could sell it to another place, you could lease it to another place, but you might get three sets of capital <laughs> Of course, that was legal and permitted at the time. Of course, all of those uh, things have changed. Another big part of my job was going to Sweden with uh, Mike Dolan and Mark Pearson and people like that. Uh, Mike Dolan passed away, may he rest in peace. And they used to sell the aircraft into Swedish investors. Uh, so uh, very early on, I was getting a broad taste of how aircraft leasing and financing worked. So, uh, David, if uh, through your career path, you know, uh, as I mentioned, after Oryx, you moved on into various roles and what you're currently doing is you're working uh, as a, a member of board of directors of AV Lease. And I think you're also a special advisor in Ergo Holdings and uh, principal in uh, Solus Capital Founders, uh, Capital Partners, right? Yeah. Uh, if I may just request you to just give us a little understanding of your role in these organizations, uh, AV Lease, Ergo Capital, Solus Capital. That'll be great to know, please. Great. Uh, thanks, Alex. So, uh, AV Lease has been set up over a year by the uh, PIF of uh, Saudi Arabia. And it's a really exciting company. It's uh, being run by uh, Ted O'Byrne, who you know from Carlisle and from Aircap days. And um, it's nice. growing very rapidly with a regional focus in the first instance and then a pivot internationally. Really proud of my involvement with that company and on the um, various committees, audit committee, uh, remuneration committee and uh, transaction committee there. And I think it's a company with great prospects and future, obviously very well capitalized and um, looking forward to the growth there. With Ergo Holdings, uh, I'm an advisor and given my background in asset management, I've set up for Ergo their asset management uh, division. Historically, actually it goes back to your first question, historically they were a balance sheet lessor managing funds for their main investor, which was Carval, and now they're, uh, they've pivoted to be an international uh, asset management company. And actually, since then, we added about, um, the, there's been added in the last two to three years, six billion of assets. So it's a very significant growth within 
ergo 4 billion of which are assets under management. So a very a period of very strong growth. Uh, Solace Capital is an asset manager in the Wealth Management Fund, and I set it up in 2016 before I left Oryx, and it basically provides asset management and um, fund services, uh, as in it has set up an, a number of investment funds, particularly in Malta, and it's UK regulated and um, I'm the principal of that company. I founded it, and we'll see where that goes. So far, so far, it's still going good, uh, which, which is which is which is good. And um, then there's the uh, arbitration court uh, issues yeah. as well. So that's excellent. It looks like you have 48 hours in a day, not 24. Yeah, <laughs> that I can say all. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's of course so the time things, yourself yeah. as well. I mean, you can play a yeah. role, but not uh, in yeah. some yeah. occasions be too much in the weeds either. So it's important to have yeah. the right perspective. Another thing which which came to my notice uh, was that Sorry. since I have known you, when I remember first meeting you, you were in Oryx Aviation. I remember how kindly you took out time to meet me a few times when you were the CEO in Oryx. And yeah. one of the things which stood out for me over the last few years is a lot of the, if I may say so, the alumni, you know, in quotes of Oryx have spread out all around the world in some very uh, important, I may say, leadership positions in different leasing companies and in the industry. So it seems like Oryx Aviation of that time ha was a great breeding ground for future leaders. And yeah. uh, obviously, for me, in my mind, the connection is there mm -hmm. with you being at that time. The, the, a lot of people whom I meet in the industry now have worked in some form or other under you directly or indirectly. So yeah, I, I would great. like to know what do you think was the reason? What what was mm -hmm. unique? One of the things possibly I can think is Oryx was an early starter in the industry, obviously. But other than that, you know, what played a role in shaping mm -hmm. up these future leaders? What do you think was was happening? What was the secret sauce really, which helped yeah. to groom these future leaders? Yeah, so I'm really pleased you asked that question. So I can quote a fact, which is that there are currently five CEOs of uh, aircraft lessors who worked uh, for me or with me in Oryx. Uh, so that, I think that's a pretty good track record to yeah. have. And I do think we did have a secret sauce. Um, so let me take you back a bit before I answer the question to go to what is that secret sauce. Uh, not so secret, but um, probably a combination <laughs> of things that collided. Um, when I uh, became CEO of Oryx, um, I'd spent some time in asset management, in finance, and I'd spent a lot of my time working with technical people. Um, one of the things which I really enjoyed in my career, and I enjoyed it intellectually and physically and mentally, uh, was to be with technical people, engineers. Now, of course, I'm not an engineer and I don't think like an engineer. I hope I don't look like an engineer. I'm in as a pen here. I can put in my top pocket and I could imitate one. But uh, we had great fun. And the fun we had was because we were different. Uh, so an engineer and a finance guy and a marketing guy, they're three different things, you know. Uh, they're chalk and cheese, really. And uh, what I enjoyed, though, was when I was working uh, with the engineers was we, we would be drafting the uh, detail of return conditions or, uh, say, an engine shop visit or, say, the maintenance reserves provisions. And there's big shifts in money in this. And... Um, I think that I was lucky early on that I recognized and was uh, part of drafting some very complex engine agreements and other things. And I understood both the marketing implications and the financial implications. And I could translate for my technical friends, um, you know, and I had some really great people that I worked with, but I could translate their words and concerns and risks and opportunities 
into contracts. And I think that was a great foundation for me to become a CEO in the aircraft leasing space. And when I did, I set up a strong, uh, separate asset management team, not reporting to finance and not reporting to, you know, slightly separate outside the the core finance team so that we could manage well, technical. Was it something which was unique at the time? Because uh, now it is, yeah. that is how all the leasing companies are mostly now, right? Or is that something which yeah. was a different thing well, to do at that To be honest that with you, um, when I didn't, and it's a, another point that came up in some of the other interviews, I didn't spend much time worrying about other leasing companies. You know, I had my own job to do. And uh, so I had to carve out a business. When I started with uh, the CEO of Rx, we only had like uh, 28 odd aircraft that were bought and they were A1 powered A320s. So they were they were problem aircraft technically. And uh, I grew that company by 2020 to uh, 300 aircraft and 12 billion of assets and a huge asset management business. So it was a vastly different business at the end than it was at the start. But the foundation throughout was the same. Uh, Oryx was a very disciplined, it is a very disciplined uh, technical company with a very strong asset management uh, tradition. And that's at the core of its activities. And that means we are not just a banking operation. Uh, in other words, buying paper with a certain yield and letting it out to the market. So the vision that I had for Oryx at the time was it was very strong on both, of course, very low cost of funds, so it could compete very effectively, but also that it had a very strong asset, legal, technical uh, capability. And that then leads itself into the market presence. You know, you get the market presence by having those other uh, capabilities. And obviously, you know, I grew it through a number of crises. We had, the, you know, the SARS, we had, well, we had September 11th to start with, with them with SARS. Uh, we had the global financial crisis and uh, the ultimate uh, challenge of all, of course, uh, was was COVID, which uh, I retired though from, I was, uh, I retired in 2019, leaving in uh, June 2020. So yeah. I had, sir, I'd done 30 years from, you know, starting really the company and growing it and developing it to uh, a huge powerhouse in aviation at that stage. So it was good timing. But right. the secret sauce for us, and yeah. we didn't look, I don't think we were looking too much at what other people did. Uh, and it's an interesting point because if it, I was always looking at the other top 20 aircraft leasing companies in terms of how they're all different, not in terms of how we all do the same things or trying to copy what they emulate, what they were doing, but they're all different. Uh, they have a different shareholder. They have a different focus on the aircraft they want. They have a different ambition. They're sometimes more focused to be a fund. They're sometimes more focused to be a banking type operation. They're sometimes more focused on the Japanese operating lease market, the asset management side. So um, actually the segment is very differentiated in the top players. Uh, they're not the same. They're different and they behave differently and they chase different assets at different times. One question, which may, maybe just to, this is very interesting what you have just explained about how Oryx was heavily focused on the asset management piece also, right? I, I mean, and I know a big part of, if, I, if I'm if i not wrong, Oryx business was from the asset management side. I mean, is there a way uh, where you can maybe define for the for the sake of our audience how that asset management model is different from just a pure leasing model, for example? Just a way to, and uh, yes. I think this is more like an academic question, just to understand the difference. Yes. So, um, Oryx was both, both a balance sheet uh, lessor and an asset manager. So, a balance sheet lessor is effectively buying, selling, trading aircraft, holding them, but not bringing in external investors or capital. <clears throat> Whereas an asset manager is either... Um, going out to the market and managing assets on behalf of existing owners or distressed owners, 
are buying aircraft and specifically putting them in, say, like Castle Lake to the ABS market, like Oryx to the Japanese operating lease market, um, like other, uh, you know, BBAM, etc. So uh, they're asset managers and they're uh, placing aircraft into specific marketplaces, be the ABS market, uh, like Carlisle, uh, be it the JAL market, uh, be it U.S. investors and funds who want to hold the assets for the yield, or pension funds who like the um, you know lower yielding but higher credit type assets. In fact, almost everybody is an asset manager as opposed to a pure uh, balance sheet player. Aircap is the most pure balance sheet player, but you could say it's a public company which manages public money and puts it into aircraft. So ultimately, everybody's an asset manager, but um, some uh, players are much like ALC and Aircap uh, are much more focused on their balance sheet and produce, taking public money, creating a balance sheet and creating profitability and growth for their investors, which is the public. So they are, in effect, an asset manager also, but they're more using their balance sheet as opposed to providing investment products in different segments i think that's very well put if if i may try and summarize it my understanding is that all lessers are effectively asset managers as you have already uh, said but that doesn't mean that all asset managers are necessarily lessers there could be asset managers who are not lessers but all lessers are definitely asset managers as you have rightly explained i think yeah. even though they're managing public money you know mm. so you know, looking at your illustrious uh, career, if I may say, David, this is really impressive. I have this list here of since you moved on from uh, Oryx, you have been on the board of various companies. You know, and recently you're associated with uh, Ergo Holdings as a special advisor as well. And one of the things which I notice which you're doing is a great initiative is on the Hague Court of Arbitration for Aviation where you're working uh, as a vice chair of the advisory board, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Would, you, would you just like to just tell us a little bit, because this is a new initiative, I think it will help the audience to understand what is this all about and uh, what is your role in this and what is the Hague Court of uh, Arbitration for Aviation is all about? Yeah, of course. Uh, delighted. So Paul Jebley, uh lawyer used to be Pillsbury and is now Withers, uh, actually had the idea to set up the Hague CA, which is the Hague Specialist Court of Arbitration, which works within the framework of the uh, Hague International Court of Arbitration. And he started that endeavor 2020. And uh, since then, it's obviously up and running. And I'm the uh, vice chair of the advisory board and the chair of the technical committee, uh, standing technical committee. So the um, the court is designed really to be an arbitration court with very specialist focus on aviation. And that's why we've brought together over 80 experts from the aviation sector, from the lessors, the finance side, the MROs, the manufacturers, uh, etc., to um, advise and input into the rules of arbitration in the first instance. And now that the rules of arbitration have been settled with the Hague Court, with the rules of mediation. So our focus now just currently, and we just had a meeting on it um, last week, with a large number of attendees. Actually, it's very challenging to have these meetings because we have so many attendees to get a time slot right. and to have an agenda and to get the minutes right, etc. But what we're trying to do now is to have more influence on the mediation rules so that um, people in aviation can, with confidence, put in a mediation or arbitration clause into their contracts, knowing that they won't just be going to a court where maybe that court doesn't have the specialist expertise and not just to an arbitral institute, which, you know, so they go, they can get a specialist arbitral uh, and mediation service. But actually, the our viewpoint is that we want to promote arbitration generally, whether it's in London or Singapore or the Hague court as well, because it's a not-for-profit uh, 
operation, organization. It's a foundation, in fact. And I think that over time, it is, it's not a quick fix. I mean, over a few years, uh, three, four, five years, it'll begin to have a major impact. I mean, I was just thinking about it the other day and I'm thinking about all the supply chain issues. And um, Alok, you'll be seeing it in your business. Um, yeah. And there's terrible disputes can be, can come out of that. But also, it's not the forum to litigate either. So um, you have genuine problems uh, in the supply chain, uh, but that doesn't obviate manufacturers or suppliers from certain responsibilities, yet litigation is not the answer in the first instance. So I think it's, that's a very good example of where mediation or arbitration uh, clauses in those contracts can be meaningful, and it can also lead to much quicker resolution. And, for example, the cost of mediation as compared with, uh, I think, arbitration litigation is in the small percentile. I, I was told a percentage and I didn't believe it. It was so low. So it is significantly cheaper, quicker and more responsive. But in particular, more um, the experts that will be used are experts in the area, which is a a much quicker way to access a sort of, a, I suppose, justice or the right answer in in terms of these yeah, type yeah. of disputes. And you're right. And this is where I was leading this question to the next point of a live example from where I am right now, which you must be very well aware. What is going on with Go First Airlines in India? Yeah. It is going through a bankruptcy process. And they have said that their reasons are, one of the reasons, key reasons is engine issues with mm -hmm. PW. Uh, uh, while we may have our own opinion of why they're going down, but at least on the face of it, they're in a dispute now with the yeah. PW on their engine yeah. issues. And I believe they went through some arbitration, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm wondering, uh, a Hague CA possibly, when yes. it would be fully ready, can play in future and a role in this kind of situation and help resolve the situation faster and in a more cost-effective manner, isn't it? Yes. And that's a really good example. And um, I believe also that uh, India has, and I, you, you probably know more about this than me, but I think it's adopted some legislation or it's in, in, in process to demand that certain companies have arbitration clauses before they resort to litigation. Yeah. And I think that could be a growing trend internationally. Certainly, it's, it's far, far sighted by the Indian uh, government to be introducing such legislation, I believe. Yeah, definitely. And in India, as you know, in the gift city of India on the West Coast, uh, Gujarat State, they have, they're setting up you have mentioned the very beginning when Ireland was growing the aircraft leasing business, they had set up an IFSC. So India has set up its first IFSC, so to speak. And uh, it is in early days right now. But one of the positive steps they have taken uh, is they have set up the uh, Singapore arbitration bench there uh, so that the various parties who operate there can resolve matters through arbitration rather than through yes. litigation. Yes. So, so, so I can imagine, you know, if tomorrow Hague CA is spreading and looking at various regions, possibly one of the places they would look at is also gift city in India, you know? Yes. Yes, India indeed. Such a big and possibly with my ergo hat as an asset manager, I'll have to go down to yeah. gift city and see if there's any investors there. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, it's a big world and it's always opening up and new opportunities. Yeah. I mean, the growth, the growth in India over the next 10, 15 years will be phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Look, it looks like that. It definitely looks like that. I am going to to change the beat a little bit because I have a set of special questions just for you. Oh, because I think there are areas on which you can contribute. I mean, beyond the, the usual, because I, have, I pretty much have tried and uh, summarized your career here and got a little understanding of the new initiatives. But there are certain things, I think, which I believe, David, you are uh, the best person to tell us. Uh, this is a topic uh, you know very well about JOL and JOLCO. And I'm going to just uh, spell out the full form because I've got feedback from my audience that not everyone 
who is hearing this podcast knows everything about the full form of these terms you know so japanese operating lease is jol and jolco is japanese operating lease with a call option now i think oryx in your oryx days and maybe even now you are you have been very close to these right and uh, during the pandemic time especially till last year i know there was a, a case uh, which was most publicized about jp lease and some assets in vietnam Uh, which had some jol or uh, jolco related issues and apparently at least what i have heard is there is a, there is a issue that maybe jol and jolcos people are saying is a thing of the past i don't know what is your opinion are they still active or will they not be active now anymore yeah so i think the actually i so i just read before i actually started this i did a bit of reading and i read because the tokyo <laughs> conference was on in uh in tokyo obviously in tokyo conference in tokyo yeah, yeah. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago but um it seems that the jol uh, jolco market is uh, has has come back a bit um but let's let's just get back to a little bit of definition so a jol will be a single investor and a jolco will generally be multiple investors uh so uh now what happened in the years 2017 18 and 19 which were obviously very good for aircraft leasing and aircraft leasing was growing i mean it was growing as a percentage of uh aircraft operated from about 42% and heading up towards the 50% mark and uh the air, airlines were moving into profitability making about 30 40 30 uh, 30 odd billion per annum in aggregate and um the jol market had expanded to about 4 or 5 billion dollars worth of assets annually or more uh, it's not really transparent and um so a lot of japanese investors had bought wide body aircraft with uh, southeast asian carriers and then moving to latin american carriers so if you take initially that the credit mix of the um jol jolco uh airlines was say top 15 to 20 uh in say 2012 13 and then by 2018 19 it was say top 40 So right. as soon as covid came unfortunately for the jol investors and jolco investors a lot of the airlines uh obviously had significant payment difficulties and problems which are well documented so the jol market has recovered to a stage where it's the top 15 uh airlines that can attract uh, jol funding and is beginning to recover but there are other issues such as the strike to the dollar you know etc so um yeah the jol, i expect the jol market will uh recover and i think the of particular note is that the japanese economy and the japanese stock market is rising strongly and there's significant profitability within japanese companies so it's uh, an improving situation for the jol market but slow and credit is paramount to that market i mean investors need to know that the aircraft will be purchased in the case of the jolco uh, or that it'll get to the end of the lease term in the case of a a single investor uh, jol and there is more debt in the aviation sector i mean debt had increased immediately post covid to about 800 billion whereas pre covid it was it was still a startling 600 billion and um i believe fish catch just issued numbers so about 50 billion has been repaid so there is a repayment uh going on by airlines but post covid what we see is that the percentage of the lease market controlled by uh the leasing community is roughly 60% whereas pre covid it was you know touching heading towards 50% yeah. um but this is a very big move upwards uh and also the abs market is currently effectively sort of in in hibernation until the interest yeah. rate uh issues so the only market you've got other and I, you're wondering why I'm answering that in, in the context of the oil market but the only other market you have other than the abs market currently will be the jol and jolco market and um 
with the state of the Japanese economy being relatively strong, actually, but with the dollar yen issues, uh, that, that looks like a recovering market, but a focus really on the top, top 15 names, which actually compresses the JAL players into very tight economics um, with, uh, with a few airlines who can command very good pricing on both the debt and the, you know, the lease rental side of that mar- in that marketplace. The JOL and JOLCO market traditionally has always been uh, particular about high credit worthy airlines only. Yes. But what I'm understanding you're saying is that possibly that will become even more stringent in the short term now. For time oh yeah, in, in the short term, I think it's paramount that uh, it's the top 15 of the airlines uh, worldwide can attract uh, JAL or JALCO funding. 15 or 50, sorry, 15? No, 15. Oh, no, no, it's it, not top 50, no. <laughs> Do you have a top 50 of airline credits? I'd love to see it. <laughs> That's why. Like, I, I don't mean that in a bad way, Ben, but everybody knows <laughs> airlines. Uh, are, you know, airlines are very susceptible. Uh, that's why the industry is so interesting. We're all very susceptible to external shocks and to yeah. oil price movements, to GDP, to consumer demand, etc. But yeah. I mean, the airlines are doing fantastically at the moment, and it's great. It's great to see. I mean, everywhere I've been traveling a lot, and I'm sure you have. And everywhere you yeah, go, yeah. it's it's nice busy. Support. It's very busy. I'm here in Portugal at the moment, and it's. I would say twice as busy as normal uh, in the Algarve, which is a holidaying spot, and uh, it's uh, it's very very busy, and uh, no, right. it's great to see. But uh, and long may it last as well. Uh, but we are seeing a huge uptick in travel. No, I, and you're and, absolutely right. Yeah. I last week I was in US and a couple of airports I transitioned through and. There was no space to, frankly, one of the airports, there was no space to stand. It was that busy. I was surprised. Yeah. One flight was delayed by two hours and the airport was just jammed. You know, it was, yeah. Hey, yeah. You're right. It's a good problem to have for airlines. Oh, yeah. It's definitely <laughs> so, a first world problem. But uh, the only thing I'd, I wish, actually, you know, I always feel sorry for my airline customers because I often think they're very let down by the um, airport authorities. And uh, I'd love to see better uh uh, accountability by the airport authorities for some of their decisions around the way they, you know, uh, load passengers onto planes, the space they give to airlines, and uh, generally the security aspects as well. You know, going to like to some bizarre sort of queues and unnecessary uh, hindrance to travel. I think it's probably quite a uh, something we should debate at some of the conferences, but there should be, yeah, you know, yeah. the airlines should be better served um, to get get passengers in and out of airports. And it also goes actually to the environmental issue because we talk a lot about SAF, we talk a lot about, um, you know, aircraft, but simple solutions such as not having aircraft, you know, idling and taxiing for hours might be it might be a good way to start. Yeah, the fuel one is high, and you're right. Bad for environment. The on the support to the airlines, you know, one area which maybe you can weigh upon even more. I was hoping to hear what is your thoughts on the the supply chain issues. You you mentioned that briefly in a previous answer, uh, but yeah. those issues are very much here. They are staring us at the face now, and we are seeing the impact real time. Uh, I am like the. Kind the airplanes which we are managing, for example, through various processes for various clients, mm-hmm. we are seeing airplanes getting delayed, stuck in MROs, waiting parts. All that is really happening, and uh, engines taking time to come out of the shop. Do you do you see that ending anytime soon? Do you maybe do you have any inside knowledge to share with us as to what do you think will happen eventually? How will this this uh, this play out in the next few months? Well, I'm quite concerned about it because there's some conflicts of interest there. Uh, in fact, as you know, uh, some uh, suppliers may benefit from the <clears throat> supply chain issues in that they charge higher prices for, um, you know, for for their stock um, and also for the refurbishment of parts. Uh, 
uh, you know, there may be a shortage and they can charge what they want for exchange parts. So I think there is um, a real problem in the supply chain and I don't see any resolution to it within 2023, more likely 2024 or 2025. Now, in capitalistic systems, these things generally resolve themselves because the void is, 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 you know, the vacuum is met by somebody else producing and supplying. But in the case of aviation, you can't get the licenses. You don't have the intellectual yeah. property. So, there, you know, there, in a situation where you have a duopoly, effectively, um, there, may, there needs to be real focus on this by Boeing and Airbus and the major manufacturers. And it needs to be resolved. And I, was, I would suspect that people will soon become very tired of it and we'll see a lot of uh, disputes, um, you know, because there is significant cost being added to the airlines by lack of parts and uh, on occasion, lack of an ability to get an engineering drawing. So how long can it take to get an engineering drawing? In your mind, Alec, and you're well used to looking at reconfiguring aircraft, how much? How long would you say it would be reasonable to procure the drawing? This is before you even start the modification work. Well, engineering order for a cabin modification, yeah. matter yeah. of few days, it's what we have been used to, at least yeah. in the past. Well, what would you expect it to be today? I think today it is a matter of, it has gone maybe exponentially high. It's even taking two, two months is what yeah. I've, I've been told. And yeah. uh, in case of some of the parts, as you rightly mentioned, the pricing of refurbished parts, uh, computers and all I've heard is gone three times now from yeah. pre-COVID times. Yeah. So, so you're right. There is a serious problem here. And uh, what you mentioned underlines to a large extent why that is happening. So hopefully it will come to a head and get resolved at some mm. stage soon. The right. There is only so much the industry can take, you know. Yeah, I think it's a big problem. And I think it'll get resolution through people um, having some hard conversations, uh, maybe eventually through arbitrations or litigations. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, but uh, it's definitely a major feature of the world we live in and the transitions of um, used aircraft uh, are all the more difficult in this environment. And it sort of goes back full circle to where we are about asset management. And that's why when you're dealing with asset managers or lessors, so to speak, you need, you need to have people who can navigate their way through that, just as you need sort of your technical yeah. uh, guys and your technical team uh, who have specialized and who have, you know, hands-on experience, not like um, last year's experience, but, you know, experience yeah, yeah, yeah. A continu within a continuum. And uh, that's why I think the aviation sector is so interesting because there's so many different experts and we have to draw them all together. Uh, so we get good outcomes. This whole story, the way it is playing out now, the uh, like I, I mentioned to you about go first and what is happening with Pratt engines. And I know Pratt has come back with their statements about go first and maybe none of our, us are in a position uh, to to basically say who is right or wrong. We don't know. Though we know there is, there is a middle ground. There is somewhere, the truth is somewhere in between as always. But Having said that, the fact remains that Pratt engines, uh, the gear turbofan engine is causing problems worldwide. Uh, yes, uh, India is maybe the most affected due to other reasons too, but, but it is having an effect not just in India. It is having an effect in Europe and elsewhere too. That's what uh, we know of. How, how will this, how is in your opinion this affecting the market? Uh, uh, in the long, how, how, like in your role as an advisor in various companies, as a board member, what advice are you giving to, to those boards or what is your opinion on this? Uh, and how, how this is weighing on the market now? Yeah. So I, I don't want to comment specifically on that case and, uh, or the Pratt and Whitney engines, but I can tell you what the impact of such issues is, is that, sure. um, 
there is a shortage of aircraft at the moment uh, and there's a shortage developing because more capacity is being, has been put into the market and is being put into the market. But for the manufacturer in the long term, it means a residual value uh, differentiator of their product versus other competing product. And that's not good for the engine type. Obviously, my early career was spent dealing with a rather difficult uh, engine type, which was the A1 powered uh, V2500 uh, engine, which ultimately was resolved through various uh, initiatives by the manufacturer. Uh, Actually, you have answered that question very well, David, without getting into the actual uh, engine manufacturer whom I asked about, but you have explained that point extremely well. Uh, So that is exactly what I was looking for, just to get an understanding of the impact. Mm. And, uh, you know, uh, I have a a follow-on question though. So we have been also seeing tri-party agreements. I know pre-COVID, there was a lot of talk about tri-party agreements with between OEMs, lessers and airlines, PBH, Total Care, etc. These are the names, some of yes. the names of these kind of agreements. Do, do you think as a lesser, would you recommend that now, knowing what you know now, would you recommend that lessers enter into such agreements or asset managers, lessers enter into such agreements now going forward? Well, in many cases, you have no choice because the manufacturer is... Uh, so well established with the airlines and has uh, programs in place. Uh, would I prefer to revert? So let's let's go back for those who probably don't know the full history, but originally um, the sure. lessor would take a maintenance reserve for the unconditioned part of the engine and separately for the life-limited parts. And uh, what you're talking about is tripartite agreements with GE or Rolls-Royce on the engine side. But now the um, GE and Rolls-Royce have set up systems to supply the uh, parts, a payment by the airline directly to Rolls and um, a payment for the unconditioned nature of the engine and then ultimately for the replacement and use of the engine life-limited parts. And um, those agreements can work well if well administered as between the airline and the engine manufacturer. And there's clear visibility of what the payments are by the airline uh, to the manufacturer and clear transferability in the event of a default of the airline. And I think these are the areas that the agreement, the agreements may fall down as we see you know, the lessors need to understand what the agreement is with the airline. They need visibility of what the payments have been. And if there has been any default by the airline, it should be notified uh, to the lessor, but that hasn't always been the case. So the lessor can, in some occasions, be disadvantaged by these arrangements. In general, though, the arrangements should work well, whereby once it's in a TCA, total care arrangement, call it that, um, that the manufacturer and the airline are making sure the engine is fully funded because these on wide body aircraft, you know, 777s um, on, you know, A330s, 787s, these are massive amounts of money. And um, it's right that there's proper provision made uh, for those events. So, uh, you, 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 you know, you've asked a really close to the bone question as, uh, <laughs> you know, I've actually just placed, uh, on behalf of Ergo, uh, seven, uh, seven, eight, seven, nine, seven, eight, seven, eight, you know, and at the core, and we're marketing some A330s. So at the core of those arrangements are whether they're in the TCA or whether they're not in the TCA. And do we have the visibility of how much it takes to put them back in the TCA? And do we have visibility of how much the airline paid, the previous uh, airline that may no longer exist has paid to, yeah. to, to the uh, engine at the manufacturer so they're right because they're very complex yeah, sorry, sorry, as ahead. well and yeah. uh, there can be uh, significant differences between engines operated in, in for example india or mexico or north america or southeast yeah. asia 
and for example in Southeast Asia, Thai, which went into restructuring, we saw a whole lot of uh, problems uh, arise due to due to certain you know certain humidity issues and uh, other things like that you know yeah. and then you see other things in in India depending on the climatic zone and obviously yeah. in um, Middle East as well uh, it tends to be very hot and sandy so you know you've different environments as well and in a way it's it's, it's so there's positives and negatives I mean in a way it's very good that the ultimate responsibility falls with the engine manufacturer. Uh, but I caveat that with a whole load of points around assignability, visibility of what the payments are, and transparency in the arrangement. Because the new generation engines, let's let's move away from naming any engine manufacturer, but new generation engines, as they go to the uh, the airplanes on which they're fitted, as this aircraft move through the second phase of their lease life, as they get remarketed five years, six years, I am just wondering how will like PBH, for example, for our audience sake, I'm just going to say uh, power by the R agreements. Mm. Uh, let us say that is a general name for such agreements. How will the rates change? What impact it will have? What role will that then play from a lesser's point of view for remarketability of the asset? And someone will have to hold the, as they say, pay the check, right? Somebody will have to bear the the the, the cost of it. So I'm just wondering, you know, how will that all play out? You, you may or may not have an opinion on that. Well, I, I sort of already I'm, told you the answer because, but, <laughs> you know, Alok, I'm going to uh, say, you've gone very serious all of a sudden. We're getting into engine total care agreement. I mean, <laughs> you told me this is going to be a lighthearted uh now you're getting deep into the... Into I can the, edit this out. I can edit this serious part like, out. This is about the most serious uh, sort of really... Um, I don't think I'd, everybody's turned off about 15 minutes. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I'm trying to learn, you know, from you. Yeah. I'm taking the opportunity to learn things which I don't yeah. know about. Well, I think I think for me, the key thing is not so much... what well, it's, it's that the... As an owner, you have visibility of the payments by the airline to roles or GE under the arrangement, and that you have the ability to assign that um, arrangement to the next operator if your current operator, unfortunately, has problems. So it's an asset that should go with the aircraft. And that's where a lot of problems arise. There may not be the... Um, transparency that you thought there was and there may be cross fertilization of pots across engines and uh, we need to have accountability by the manufacturers in those arrangements but i'm sure now you've, point. you've really bored everybody <laughs> and it's your fault, not mine. i tried to squeeze i tried to squeeze the juice out of this yeah <laughs> Uh, okay, so I'm going to change the topic. I hint, hint, well taken. I'll, I'll change the topic and I'll ask you one, one more question about the market, but not about any of the engine issues. Mm. Aircraft values, you know, at the long haul, short haul airplanes. Yeah. Uh, you just mentioned about the kind of transactions you have been involved in. In so, which is a better or a or a safer investment in the current climate, in your opinion, a long haul or short haul, and why? Yeah. So uh, again, you have to just have a really quick look at the past and in the past um, wide body values have declined much more uh, steeply in uh, downturns and I think in the recent downturn we've seen that the some of the wide body values are at 40% of what they were uh, pre-COVID which is pretty dramatic loss of value in the aircraft. Now, narrow body aircraft uh, recovered much more quickly. And that's in part due to the fact that a lot of wide bodies are located in the APAC and uh, Asi Asian region. And that was where uh, zero COVID, the Chinese policy, uh, extending into that whole, extended into that whole region and really the opening up trade occurred in um, December 2022, January 2023. So it's actually just, it's hard to believe, four months ago, uh, like I, I 
was residing in Hong Kong and it was still zero COVID um, up to, uh, you know, uh, mid-December uh, 2022. So the opening up and the renewed demand for A330s and 737 900s and, you know, triple sevens, the bigger demand area is only occurring uh, right now. Whereas narrow bodies to recovery began very strongly, actually, at the, um, uh, it's hard to remember because things have happened so quickly. But if I'm right, it was about uh, January 2022, it was really autumn 2021. And then, unfortunately, we had the Ukraine invasion by Russia. I think that was that February 2022. Uh, yeah. yeah, and that, so uh, just before that, actually, a lot of confidence was returning to the narrow body market, but not to the wide body market. And um, that confidence was really dented uh, until about, uh, it took about three months to understand what was going on. And uh, then through the summer of 2022, yeah, we saw a marked um, uplift in in narrow body rentals, but very little uplift in uh, wide bodies, which we began to see actually with um, the anticipation of China opening up in the autumn of 2022. And so much so that like 787s and A330 market has risen 30, 40, 50% in terms wow. of lease rental. But you know, 50% of nothing is still not great. And they're still way off where they should be. I mean, these are aircraft that sold at over $120 million, say 2018. And um, I'm not going to say the trading price of them for those few that aircraft <laughs> that did trade, but it was dreadful. And um, I think right. the recovery is ongoing. I think there's about 110 stored A330s, which had been about 300 last year. So the storage level is going way down and the reactivation level is going way up. But these aircraft are also caught in the supply chain issue. So to get them back into service is taking six to nine months. But I do expect a continuing recovery and strong recovery, but strong because, you know, percentages don't tell you a lot. Um, you had power by the hour arrangements plus minimums. Uh, they should be gone now. Uh, and the fundamental value of these aircraft is far more than even today's value, uh, if you look at the valuers who would reflect. So I think I see strengthening um, demand and value for the 777s, the A330, and um, the 787. Uh, but they won't recover to their pre-COVID levels, uh, those that have been caught in, in this situation. They will not recover, you're saying? No, like, not recover. For a while no, more. not recover fully because they've lost three years of value. Uh, don't forget aircraft that have sat on the ground for three years. You have another issue around the uh, maintenance cycle, uh, etc. So, But they're, the, the other point about it is they're bloody great aircraft because they haven't been used as much as long as they've been stored and brought back to life correctly. They, they have the effect of life in them of newer aircraft. Interesting you mentioned that because like in Acumen, we have mm. our, our iStat appraisers in our team. And uh, one of the topics which they told me they have been debating with customers back and forth, mm. especially since last year, post the pandemic kind of getting ended, was this exact topic of how the values are getting affected on the assets which have been grounded. And uh, also on the supply chain, what you mentioned is, I am sure you are aware of, I heard that the first 787 just got parted out. So whoever parted it out must have done it with a solid business case, mm. uh, riding on the fact that there is a supply chain problem and parting yeah. it out makes sense and they can yeah. make good money on it. I think they did. And I think that they'll make good money on it because there's a lot of uh, 787 <clears throat> currently returning to service. Yeah. 
So it does. It does make yeah. it makes uh, it makes total sense. I am going to move on to a favorite topic of yours, not aviation. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> and uh, a topic of a topic which is of which is your favorite, but not aviation. Oh, good. <laughs> What? Soccer. Oh, soccer. <laughs> soccer. Well, my favorite is playing soccer, <laughs> not uh, not talking about soccer. But uh, yeah, yeah. So I should tell you why. You know, I I mean, I know that you love soccer, and I I have also heard that when you were in Oryx, you hold you used to hold a weekly soccer match. Yes, yes. Form teams, and you used to play yourself. Oh yeah, right? of course. Yeah. So you know. My son, he's a, he's into soccer uh, too. He, he's he's right now he's in school learning soccer. He's and I mentioned to him yesterday that I'm uh, about to uh, talk to someone tomorrow in my podcast who is into soccer. So he's like, please ask him what is his favorite team. Uh, <laughs> so well, because he my favorite soccer team, too, and, gonna, and, just going to shock yeah. you, but it's Chelsea because my son follows Chelsea, Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> which is a bit of a disaster. Yeah. Which is a bit of a disaster at the moment. Yeah. But okay, actually, because I thought this was a light-hearted interview about you know the job and and how you. I think soccer is a great metaphor for how aircraft leasing companies should work and. It, it sort of means <laughs> that you pass the ball, you know, uh, teamwork and passing the ball is really critical. So actually we had a great, we had great fun and uh, we played soccer actually sometimes twice a week in uh, winter league. Uh, there was quite tough, quite tough competition. Uh, sometimes we lost like as much as 15 nil. Because did you ever lose, David? Did you ever lose, or did you? Or are you always in the winning no, team? No, actually, tell me about no, that. No, we played against GCAS, <laughs> and we played against. We went down to yeah. and We had um, that was the full eleven aside with ourselves, and we we did well in all those yeah. matches. Actually, um, we did very well um, when we put the whole team together. But we played in winter league close to us, where we got trashed because the players on the winter league were guys who were coming after work, who probably played for a sort of League of Ireland team and wanted to get in a bit of practice. <laughs> and they were really good. And they just, they just you know, ran rings around us. But we kept playing and we kept enjoying it. And that was that was the, the main thing. We won a few games as well. So, But it was, right, it, right. I, th- I thought it, um, we had great team spirit from it so that's uh, and soccer basketball you know anything you can play as a team I mean anything high rugby any of these uh, sports they're just great uh, within companies I think sports and companies go very well together in terms of um, inclusion uh, I mean soccer probably isn't the most inclusive because it was, that was a male team but we had a mixed team as well and um, you know so uh, anything that promotes health and teamwork is uh, is great in the um, you know in the corporate environment it also breaks down barriers because like nobody can be too snooty if they're yeah. on a soccer pitch on a cold wintry night in in Dublin you yeah. know there's hailstones coming down them they have to kick a football you know you just it's it's a great leveler yeah yeah you're absolutely right I mean nothing like that to break barriers yeah and build a team culture now so, if I was in yeah. India it'd probably be a cricket team but I I don't know how to they, I don't know I don't know yeah how how, how many players you need or or all the rest. <laughs> or of course you Indians guys get too passionate about it you might there might be a fight <laughs> <laughs> so cricket is same 11, 11 players uh, in, but uh, in in our company here in Bangalore we our, our uh, teammates here they mostly play soccer too mm. they actually have been participating yeah. in local tournaments every once in a while yeah. it's actually it's a great game for your health as well of yeah. course, because it pumps yeah. your heart. Very popular in India now. Yeah. Last year, we had an Acumen's off-site and uh, we had a beach-site soccer match. So, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> so, so uh, David, we are at the very end. You know, uh, thanks so much for giving yeah. so much time. I have I have a question I like to ask okay. always, you know. A couple of them, actually, to end this. But uh, first is like, uh, you know, what, uh, what advice, you know, from a career perspective, you know, you you have you have such an impressive career you have had such a long lasting innings and you're still going very strong you know which is really impressive and inspiring 
uh, as far as I'm concerned, frankly. And I, I would love I would love to know what advice you would give to the new generation of executives coming in the industry, the people who are in fact trying to get into the industry as well, those who are at junior mid level. What is one advice you think uh, they, they should hear to to grow in their career in their lives? Yeah, probably there's a load of things. So you touched on soccer. I think one thing, because it's quite a hard and we travel, is a bit of training. It's always good to keep some fitness, you know. It's also good to, you know, also socialize. So I think combining the two is a really important aspect to your life. And I think, though, that uh, don't be afraid of the detail and don't be afraid of hard work. Um, what this industry shows And the word that comes through again and again is resilience. So it's a very resilient industry. And if you ever want proof of that, look at COVID. I mean, COVID was very, very destructive. We've sort of put it behind us now in our minds. But I remember you could almost cry. I was on the... um, the cable car that goes to the big, the big Buddha in Hong Kong, and I could see Hong Kong airport, and there was no movement. There was a helicopter flying over the airport, and there was FedEx um, and Cathay uh, aircraft all parked, and you could see everything. I have the photograph, and it was an amazing sight. Uh, you know, we've been through a hell of a lot, and it recovered. We were through a hell of a lot in the global financial crisis. I mean, living in Ireland, we all got letters to say, oh, you've lost all your money, you know. So, the, and, and we yeah. came through that as well. We had SARS. SARS was very severe in Asia in um, 2003. We had obviously yes. September 11, a disastrous uh, scenario. So air, aviation is very resilient new challenges. I think the other thing, because you could labor it, but is to be very open and and giving of your opinions with your colleagues is very much an interactive sport. And I say sport because I've always considered working to be fun, not, not working. So, you know, enjoy yourself, but be very, I mean, I learned so much from my technical colleagues and then more from the finance people as I had to raise money. And then I realized, God, the marketing side is great. So I I sort of lent into every one of them at different stages of my career. And it's until you lean into these areas and um, sort of learn them that you really appreciate them. And so there's, I I wouldn't, the one thing I'd be very against is being siloed. If I found in my career I was being siloed, um, in other words, oh, you do this, but they do that, and you can't talk to them, I'll talk to them, and they'll talk to me, and I'll talk to you. Um, Yeah, I'll move on from that sort of scenario. Uh, So I think, and the other thing is that in aircraft leasing and financing, and uh, there's great companies, you know, but they're all different. So you have to pick which one suits your needs and your skill set. But I'd be uh, very much in favor of people who are open and smile a lot and optimistic because uh, God knows you got to be optimistic. Optimism always wins the day, no doubt. <laughs> right, David, we are uh, at the very end. Thank you very much for giving us so much time. Uh, uh, is there any any uh, closing message you would like to give? Anything else you would like to say? And then uh, we can wrap this up because that message which you're going to give us, we'll put it at the end of this as like like a closing message on your behalf. Oh, great. So my Thank request is if there's anything... Thanks, Alex. It's, it's, it's great to see you. I, and actually, I must have the uh, pleasure of a revenge interview with you at some stage. So that, that would be <laughs> fun. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. I'll probably work for another, I'm thinking about 30 years. So, you know, probably keep working for another 30 years and enjoying it. So wow. I, think, <laughs> I think there's plenty of room in aviation for expertise and people to expand what they do and uh, how they do it. Well, thank you very much, David. Wish you a good day ahead. Thanks, Alec. Well done.